Hello, I'm Ben Kaspit, and this is On Israel, as monitors a new podcast from Israel. Judging by the masses who jammed Tel Aviv's main square on Saturday evening, the coronavirus does not frighten the so-called corona protest against the government's handling of the COVID-19 economic crisis. We have bigger worries, they were basically saying, such as finding work and money to feed our kids and pay the rent. Benjamin Netanyahu's efforts to sabotage the event, to limit the number of participants or to get the police to do so, failed. In addition to the thousands at Rabin Square, thousands of other Israelis demonstrated for the third straight Saturday at intersections and bridges throughout the country in which has come to be known as the Black Flag protest, demanding the Prime Minister's resignation. The last time so much energy flowed through the streets of Israel was in 2011, when a massive social economic protest forced Netanyahu into forming a commission to address the protesters' demand and into releasing about 1,000 Hamas prisoners in exchange for an Israeli soldier held by the organization in Gaza for five years. This time, Netanyahu has fewer cards to play. While it seems to be trying to arrange another prisoner swap with Hamas in exchange for the bodies of two Israeli soldiers, Israelis have other concerns. They are no longer protesting the soaring cost of housing or living. This time, the demands are far more basic. The organizers keep insisting that protests are not political in nature, but there is no such thing in Israel. The protesters are essentially demanding, metaphorically of course, Netanyahu's head on a platter. Netanyahu convened an urgent news conference on Thursday to present a generous aid package, hoping to head off the planned Saturday demonstration. It did not work. In addition to the surging unemployment and grim economic outlook, the protesters also seem to be expressing disgust with the way the Prime Minister and his people are running the country. The constant attacks on democratic institutions, the focus on marginal issues, and the monstrous dimensions of the biggest government in Israel's history at the height of the country's deepest economic slump ever. Israelis are looking for someone to give them solutions to the crisis. One name that has popped up is of Israeli high-tech billionaire Erel Margalit. Considered one of Israel's most successful entrepreneurs, Margalit's name has become synonymous with that of the startup nation. The golden boy of Israel's high-tech world, Margalit plunged into the political waters in 2011, joining the Labour Party and getting elected to the Knesset. He had hoped to revitalize the liberal center-left, but after twice failing in his run for the party leadership, Erel took the hint and went back to the business world. The Labour Party continued its decline and is almost extinct. Margalit, on the other hand, is doing very well. Thank you. He has a PhD from Columbia. He is the founder and president of the most successful venture capital fund in Israeli history, JVP, with an impressive record of 26 exits and managements of billions of dollars in promising startups. Margalit is also involved in investing in high-tech startups in the geographic periphery in Israel. The political chapter in his life seems over, but he is worried about the developments in his homeland, about the leadership crisis, and now also about the crisis threatening the Jewish state's creative and flourishing economy. We spoke with Dr. Erel Margalit shortly after he arrived for a business trip to New York. We will be back here to listen to what he has to say right after one short commercial break. If you're listening to this podcast, you obviously care about the Middle East. And if you do, you should probably be reading El Monitor. El Monitor is a global newsroom headquartered in Washington, D.C., with a network of over 160 contributors around the world. El Monitor offers first-class reporting and analysis from a range of perspectives and an approach that represents the highest journalistic standards, as well as an award-winning commitment to press freedom and independence. If you haven't done so already, visit us at elmonitor.com, check out our articles, and sign up for our free newsletters. There's a lot to choose from, including the Week in Review, an essay that offers unusual insights and forecasts into the region 
based upon Omonitor's outstanding reporting. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to our Elmonitor podcast on your favorite podcast platform on Israel with Ben Caspit and on the Middle East with me, Andrew Parasoliti. We are proud to say hello to Dr. Erel Margalit in New York. How are you, Erel? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How are you, Ben? We are fine here in Israel. You uh, left us, uh, I think, yesterday. And I wanted to ask you the first question about last night. As you know, there was a massive demonstration in the Rabin Square despite the coronavirus. At the same time, thousands are waving black flags at intersections and on bridges against uh, the prime minister. Do you understand the protesters' anger? Yes, I think that... Um you know, my daughters, I have three daughters, they were all in the protests, and my wife, and I actually drove them to one of the protests uh, as I was going to the airport, both in Rabin Square and on the bridges between uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And I think that uh, a lot of the people have a sense that enough. Um, one, enough neglecting them on the economic side. Um, there's about 450,000 small businesses that feel that they are deprived of any real assistance in this crisis and that the government is uh, shooting from the hip rather than giving them support in a real um, comprehensive manner uh, that is responsible and that shows them where things are going. And people, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of unemployed people. And uh, what's even more uh, severe is that they don't feel like there's a plan. And that really came together with the political sense that this government is corrupt, quite frankly. The people feel that the prime minister is, is, needs to go to trial and defend himself rather than try to maneuver uh, his situation as um, you know, as, as the corruption emerges and his, his trial is, is beginning. And uh, the sense is that the priorities of this prime minister and perhaps some members of his government is saving their neck rather than taking care of the people. And so people had enough. Let had me enough. ask you about this exact point. You're talking on one hand the, about the economic situation, which we all share here in, in Israel. Uh, Likud supporters, Bibi supporters, uh, Bibi haters, everyone. But then when you, you're, try, you're starting to talk about the corruption and the prime minister and the criminal charges, it becomes political and then you lose half of the people. What is the right thing to do? Because they declared the, the, the Tel Aviv demonstration was declared as non-political but not everybody was convinced. What would you do in, in their, in their, uh, if you were the, the organizer? The social contract between the citizens of Israel and its government was broken. And it was broken in more than one way. People feel it in their pockets now. People feel like they're, they're not making a living and that the government is not really coming together with a plan and, you know, we have companies that have offices here in New York and in Europe. So we see how governments can come with a decent plan. It doesn't need to be a um, huge amount of money for every business, but there's a system in which you're taking care of things. And here what you're seeing is that um, the situation is being manipulated. The crisis is being manipulated. I think that each and every one of us never expected this uh, COVID-19 crisis to be so severe. And everybody understands that we need to change things and perhaps things that we anticipated before need to be different. But there needs to be an integrity in the way this is dealt with. There needs to be, um, it needs to be clear what the issues are. It needs to be not manipulated because if, if, you're fe if you feel like you're being manipulated, then the outcry is much larger when, you're, when you discover that uh, the intentions were not really there. 
Let's dive e even deeper into this, uh, this point. I guess if you've been in Israel on Thursday that you saw the Prime Minister and the Minister of uh, Treasury, Israel Katz, present their economic plan. I wanted to ask you, what do you think of the, of the aid package that they, they presented a few days ago? Critics say that while the government is throwing quite a bit of money at the unemployment, it does not have a plan to restart economy, growth engines, encouraging entrepreneurs, boost uh, vocational training, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What do you think about it? Um, well, first of all, the fact that the government is is giving some support is better than nothing. But it's now, and it's too late, and there's no plan. What does Israel need right now in order to get itself back on track? Israelis are people who are willing to take a risk and to take the burden, but they want to move forward. And the main problem right now is that there's no vector. Nobody's telling them where they're going. So small businesses need help. The government actually has a system uh, of small business agencies which is not supporting. You've got to empower them. People, first of all, need someone to talk to when the aid is given. They need a plan. I have something uh, hard to say that perhaps one third of these small businesses actually need to sit down with someone that is responsible and see how to close their business because when business is bleeding, it's taking down the entire family. But then you need to redirect the energy into something that can work. All that system that actually exists in Israel, including professional training, including redirection, including taking a lot of the things that are happening and putting them into things that can actually work, the government is not doing this. You know, um, I'm sitting with, um, in, in, in the far north in uh, the, the Galilee, where you cannot say that there's a lot of economic activity. We have meetings with high-tech people and small businesses and are meeting together in the accelerator and giving each other advice and redirecting some of the energies and people need someone to talk to and help. All these things, you know what the government is doing? The finance ministry is actually giving you one divided by 12 out of the budget so that they don't have to give extra money to different programs. That's what they're doing. So on one hand, the government is speaking. On the other hand, there's no direction. Arts and uh, culture. There is a way to continue to maintain culture, which is safe. Someone needs to say what it is. We're doing this, you know, I own a small um, performing arts center called Zappa in Jerusalem. We came up with a plan where it's safe to have certain performance and some people are online. It's not all the people that you have, but it needs something. So the people, people are okay if you tell them come up with a safe procedure and then we will be supported. But if you come out with nothing, if you change your mind every two weeks, people are lost. And when people are lost, there's desperation. And when there's desperation, there's anger and they're not going to accept it anymore. They stood up and they said, enough. Let's uh, talk about uh, your ex expertise, the high-tech industry. Given uh, COVID-19, how do you think is the Israeli high-tech sector coping? Are companies going to survive this? Are these companies, are, are the companies that are thriving in this crisis? And how is Israel planning to return to world little leadership after uh, the coronavirus will be over? You know, leadership is something that's being positioned at a time of crisis, not when things are great. Israel actually positioned itself as a leader in the high-tech sector in 2001 when the internet bubble burst and 9-11 happened, in 2008 when there was a financial crisis, and I think that now is our time to step up again. Now, we have about 60 companies in our portfolio, JVP. We had some tough discussions, and three or four companies will probably not continue in the way that they had to. But about 50 companies, we said a few things. One, raise enough money so that you'll have it for 12 to 18 months. Two, adopt. The world is not like it used to be. The people that survive are not the strongest, but those that can adopt. 
And three, see if the world today, because people are working remotely, because people need uh, different mo- uh, ways of communication, are there new opportunities for your business to thrive? And we raised $290 million in 27 rounds for different companies. We also raised about $90 million of debt from the banks. So the companies have some air, some oxygen. Now we are here in New York. We are bringing 28 companies, Israeli companies, back to the hub, the cybersecurity hub, the hub that actually um, maintains and supports hospitals here in the city, uh, the smart city and the, and, and the city facilities itself. So after this crisis, the Israelis are first to come back and open the international routes and say to the customers, we're here, we're ready, we have a solution for you, consider us and we'll help you solve your problems today. I wanted, I just wanted to ask you about what are you doing in New York because you opened a, a, an international cybersecurity center there in February with, with 30 companies. Is uh, Israeli high tech is going to take over Manhattan after we took over Berlin? I'm not going to the Leonard uh, Berlin. <laughs> well, we have, a, we have a very good discussion with Berlin as well. And I, actually, after the event that we had here, we, we had a big meeting. Uh, there's about 20,000 Israelis in Berlin. Uh, and we had a big meeting with the high tech sector in Germany. But yeah, I, I think that um, if Israel wants to continue to be, to thrive in the high tech sector, we're not like American startups or Chinese startups. American startup can be American. Chinese startup can be Chinese. Israeli startup, if it wants to succeed, it needs to be international because we have a small market. So what are we doing here? We're in the face of the customers, of the Goldman Sachs, of the JP Morgan, of the Citibank. We are in the face of the insurance companies. We are in the face of hospitals that actually are being hacked. You know, they're 47 U.S. hospitals that were hacked by cybersecurity efforts that were drawn from Iran. And we are here to give the kind of assistance that Israel can give at a time of crisis. But what do we need to do? It's not easy. It's different. The world is moving much slower. We need to communicate. We need to have the CEOs speak to each other. We need to have a connection to our community. So here in Israel, we're working in Be'er Sheba and Kiyat Shmona. Here we're working with Columbia University, with Cornell, with CUNY, with NYU, and we're taking the students and the different efforts that they have, and we're bringing them a destination. And we're saying to New York, you have a chance to go back as an international business leader, but you need Israel to make it work. For you, I guess it's very uh, special to work with Columbia University. I, I, I think, if I remember, you, you, uh, you are a doctor from uh, Columbia University. And, and yes, I have my PhD in philosophy of all things. Yes. My topic for the uh, thesis was the entrepreneurs of history. How political leaders, like entrepreneurs, can change the narrative of their people and reinvent the direction for their company, uh, country. So before going into a little into politics, I wanted the final question by, about high tech. To ask you about your vision vis-a-vis the Middle East, Arab countries. It's not a secret we have a flourishing uh, 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 negotiations and, and relationship with many Arab countries in the Middle East, not only the countries that we have peace with. What do you think about high tech as connecting tool? between uh, people and countries in the Middle East. I think you, you met uh, uh, not long ago the PM of, uh, of Greece talking about this. Yes. Well, first of all, the last exit that we just had, a company called Loom Systems, half of their business was in the Emirates, in um, Dubai and uh, Abu Dhabi. And uh, we have great connections there. And actually some of the people there co-invested with us. And what I can tell you is that um, we're doing quite a bit of business uh, with Arab countries, uh, both in cybersecurity fintech, but also now in a growing manner in food tech and agriculture, ag tech. And I think that most of the people are saying, hey guys, solve the political problem and we can change this region in a big way. And just like we're creating 
uh, Margalit Startup City, the cyber hub here in New York, we also just offered the Emirates to create the Margalit Startup City in the Emirates because they are very interesting in AI, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and fintech. And these are three things that we are cooperating with with Arab countries primarily in the Gulf. Okay, now let's dive a little uh, into politics. Uh, when you joined the Labour Party, it was still a viable leadership alternative. How do you feel about the fact that it has been wiped off the political map? Are you looking back in, back in anger or, or, or frustration or what? You know, um, sometimes uh, the greatest party and the greatest leaders like Ben Gurion, like uh, Rabin, like some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the great people that build these co this country like entrepreneurs, like people who are accomplishing things, halutzin, pioneers, we call them in Hebrew. Um, I think that a lot of that, um, a lot of that spirit disappeared from the current Labor Party. Labor Party was about building things from nothing. It was coming to the new frontier, as John F. Kennedy once said. They went after the new frontier in the south, after the new frontier in the north, we were just actually in Sdebukir where Ben Gurion lived and buried and you saw um, the modesty of a prime minister that called the people to come and settle in a place which was the desert. And that's the big inspiration that I think labor gave to many of us. And what do we need today? I, I, don't, I don't think it's just labor that's lost its way. I think an entire camp of people who want to, uh, that have so many interesting ideas outside of politics, like entrepreneurship, like social entrepreneurship, like volunteers, like education, like different projects that are changing the lives of youth. All that has stayed out of politics and we need to bring it back into politics with new messages and new symbols and perhaps new, uh, a new political effort that's going to change, um, that's going to uh, reinvent the game a little bit. Because right now, the game and the way it's played is not working for Israel. Israel is getting the most mediocre uh, uh, leadership in politics, where it has such strong leadership in other areas. Politics is the last frontier, which is the game. But maybe you are the best example of a, of a person, of a guy, so skilled and talented that could not translate his skills and ability from uh, the business and the entrepre entre entrepreneur's uh, business into politics. Maybe because, you know, you are a philosopher from Columbia University and diving into the bloody Israeli political swamp was a little naive from your side. I don't know, I think that being naive and coming with big ideas is part of what I'm proud of. Because the, that, that naivete, that uh, uh, belief that Israel is gonna come with a new chapter both politically, economically, and socially is, part, uh, is very much what I believe in. I think that what you're seeing today with Netanyahu at the end of his era, you're seeing Israel come to an end of a chapter. It doesn't matter if it's gonna take another six months or a year, but Israel's coming to an end of a chapter. The chapter that Netanyahu led is a chapter of them versus us. And let's have a clash. It could be ultra-Orthodox and secular. It could be Arabs and Jews. It could be Ashkenazim and Sfaradim. It could be right and left. And I think that right now you see that Israel needs a new chapter. When we're doing a big project in Kiyat Shmona, Kiyat Shmona is a town in the north, for those who don't know, which is a down and out town. For the first time, we're working with the kibbutzim, which are 400 yards away from Kiyat Shmona, but they were living in a different world. So when you have food tech or ag tech with a kibbutznikim and Kiyat Shmona in the city with young people that come from both sides of society, swearing to build a new idea, a new set of jobs for the galley, you're seeing the spirit of what Israel will be in its next chapter. It's a chapter that will connect, not divide. The ultra-Orthodox in Jerusalem 
are one of the best partners that we have today socially because of the economic cooperation. The Arab community in the Galilee has moved from 600 workers in the high-tech sector three years ago to 5,000 in the last three years. Many what, are all these, what are all these people saying? They say, we want to be part of the successful, innovative, open part of Israel. Give us a hand and we'll be your partners. But have the vision include us and not exclude us. But the $64 billion question is, who will be Israel's leader into this chapter? You're talking about the end of the Netanyahu era. I think it's a very long and bloody end. But how do you, do you view Israel's crisis of leadership? The fact that there is no significant alternative to Netanyahu after he managed to dismantle the only one that emerged, the Blue and White Party. Do you think, by the way, Gantz and Ashkenazi were wrong to join, the, join his government? Of course they were wrong because they were leading an alternative. What Israel needs is a new chapter and an alternative. You're seeing the frustration today at the demonstrations, both on the business side and the political side. People don't want their democracy to be torn apart. People don't want the Supreme Court to be challenged by their own leader. People feel that this is enough. The, the thing that's needed today is an alternative, which is not, how should I put it? The alternative needs to bring a broader vision than what people who are chief of staff, which is very important because security is important. But in addition to security, I think that the next big vision is one which is a civilian vision. It's a vision that talks about the healthcare system. It's a vision that talks about how you connect the North to the big high-tech revolution that Israel has. It's a vision that takes the economic cooperation between Israel, the Palestinians, the, um, you know, the, the, the Arab countries in the Gulf, and turns it into a vehicle for a political agreement. It's a vision which has the international standing of Israel work for it, not against it like they were gonna do with the annexation. It's a vision that treats the other party with respect. And when it wants to have a settlement with the Palestinians as a strong country, it does it with respect. And so annexation is the word for disrespect, because you are not my partner. When you do business, the, the single most important thing that you can do for someone who's weaker than you is give them respect. Recognize them. If you do that, you can reach the world. And that's what Israel needs to do politically as well. And I think it's possible because what we did see in this big debate about the annexation is the right wing in Israel is willing to compromise on big parts of land and take others. That gives me a bridge to move forward. It's amazing that we reached an annexation problem only two weeks after the annexation famous historical deadline, only in the last question and in your initiative, because I wouldn't even ask about it uh, after this uh, uh, fiasco, but anyway, it was fascinating. Thank you very much, former Knesset member, Dr. Rehel Margalit, for this fascinating conversation. We will be back with some final thoughts and comments after this short break. Again, thank you, Rehel. Shalom and stay healthy. Shalom and wacha. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you soon. If you're listening to this podcast, you obviously care about the Middle East. And if you do, you should probably be reading El Monitor. El Monitor is a global newsroom headquartered in Washington, D.C., with a network of over 160 contributors around the world. El Monitor offers first-class reporting and analysis from a range of perspectives and an approach that represents the highest journalistic standards, as well as an award-winning commitment to press freedom and independence. If you haven't done so already, visit us at elmonitor.com, check out our articles, and sign up for our free newsletters. There's a lot to choose from, including the Week in Review, an essay that offers unusual insights and forecasts into the region based upon El Monitor's outstanding reporting. And if you haven't done so, 
please subscribe to our El Monitor podcast on your favorite podcast platform on Israel with Ben Caspit and on the Middle East with me, Andrew Parasoliti. Thank you for staying with us. Not long ago, Dr. Rel Margalit was one of the Labour Party's major hopes for leadership. The successful entrepreneur offered a different style, a different resume. The brilliant high-tech leader assumed that the Israeli society is mature enough to digest a leader without military background, but with an impressive business portfolio instead. He was wrong or came too early. In the conversation, we heard a sharp and focused critique of the government's policy vis-a-vis the coronavirus that believes Israel is in the end of the Netanyahu era. When exactly will this end arrive and who can be the next leader of Israel? These questions remain unanswered. Hope you enjoyed it. We will meet you here next Monday in All Israel and Al Monitor. Take care.